These days, Silent Hill brings to mind the worrisome feeling of discovering a close friend is into cutting themselves. It's hard to bring up in conversation, and even harder to convince them to stop. Every few months, there's a plausible drip feed of rumors, possible screenshots, trademark renewals, or outright scam that supposedly depict a new game, getting the fans excited and then letting them down again. Coincidentally, while I was writing this, Konami announced a whole slew of new Silent Hill content, including a remake of Silent Hill 2, only further proving several of the points I'm about to make. It would seem Konami hasn't tired of handing off the franchise to questionable Western developers who keep slipping their resumes under Konami's door for a chance to make a Silent Hill game, and not just any Silent Hill game, but one that's inspired by none other than Silent Hill 2. What a novel concept. Let's chuck it on the pile of games that had the exact same idea. Silent Hill 2 stands will never release their death grip on it being the greatest game ever written. Not that I'm going to argue that Silent Hill 2 isn't a good game, but when most games are on the same level as a particularly emotional banana bread recipe written by a stay-at-home mom, outdoing them isn't a tall mountain to summit. Silent Hill 2 sits upon such a lofty throne, the entire series is haunted by fan expectations, so every new Silent Hill must genuflect before it. Hell, they even remade the original Silent Hill to be more like Silent Hill 2. This isn't something the original developers ever seemed to believe. They finished Silent Hill 2 and followed it up by making a direct sequel to Silent Hill 1, and then set the fourth game around a man who had the gall to possess not even a single traumatic event in his past, or even a past for that matter, and both focus on the more out there occult shenanigans and repressed personal trauma. So what is the central concept of Silent Hill 2 that is so alluring that no less than three western developed Silent Hill games leaned heavily on it? The memories of the protagonist don't line up with reality due to them having done something horrible in their past which they repressed. For games, I suppose it's a masterclass in the use of subtlety. Subtlety goes a long way. Without it, you just end up with ideas on display like a giant science fair project. Homecoming is just Silent Hill 2 without the subtlety. The problem Homecoming has while attempting to rehash Silent Hill 2 is that it doesn't know how to properly establish a sense of intrigue. Both games feature a dorky man in a jacket looking for a loved one. The difference being James Sunderland of Silent Hill 2 already knew that his wife was dead. So receiving a letter from her asking him to come see her at their special place piques your interest. And then it built on that by introducing a woman who looks just like James's wife and a bratty young girl who is searching for her as well. Meanwhile in Homecoming, Alex leaves the hospital and decides for no real reason that at this moment the only thing he wants to do is see his brother who he believes to be alive and well back home. And not one single person who knows the truth will tell him the kid is dead. Silent Hill itself has to take an interest in the person it wants to mess with. And even the miasma that is Silent Hill seems bored with Alex. Best it can do is conjure up his little brother now and then who runs away so Alex will follow him to the next area. This is a town that was so determined to screw with a random clerk that it created a sexier version of his dead wife to confuse the hell out of him. And then proceeded to kill her over and over again before his eyes. Silent Hill took one look at Alex Shepard and decided it was phoning in the nightmare session today. Our main character, Alex, is a veteran and the game begins with him being wheeled to a nightmarish hospital. Silent Hill was heavily inspired by the movie Jacob's Ladder, a film about a Vietnam vet whose grasp on reality is tenuous at best, and the entire story was just a dying soldier's final neurons firing, but it came with some top-notch creepy imagery for its time, particularly of a nightmarish hospital that the main character was wheeled through in a dream. Homecoming seems to believe being inspired by something means you should lift characters and scenes directly from it and transplant them into your own work regardless if it doesn't share the same blood type. Alex can break free of leather restraints with sheer brute force. Makes you wonder why escape artists make it look so complicated. Josh. Josh, is that you? I think I've identified the unique problem every western developed Silent Hill game shares. They're all way too excited to be a Silent Hill game. They can't wait to bust out recreations of the series' greatest hits. Previous games began with a nightmare, so must this one. Previous games had a strange child just out of reach, so therefore this game must have a strange child just out of reach. Every good idea someone might try to attribute to Homecoming was just a better executed moment in a different game. Josh, where are you going? No, wait, stop. I can't possibly chase after you. Homecoming released not long after the Silent Hill movie, and it seems they adapted ideas from that misuse of the franchise as well, such as recreating the Hell World transformation scene and going as far as adding the sexy nurses as enemies. Western devs seem to be under the belief that the nurses are a staple Silent Hill enemy. The sexed up monster nurses were a creation of James Sunderland's mind in Silent Hill 2 that represented his repressed sexual urges. The most horrifying thing about this game is that many of the enemies seem to suggest sexual frustration on the part of the protagonist. And when said protagonist spends the entire game searching for a little boy, your eyes will cog northwest for a full minute while you ponder the implications. At least James was looking for his wife while wandering Silent Hill with an erection. I mentioned in my downpour video that western devs seem resigned to the fact that the only improvement they can make on the series is combat. It's a fair assessment. Even fans are unlikely to claim they enjoyed the melee combat that has all the intensity of an old man defending himself from an aggressive goose with a cane. But when you make the player character more capable, the enemies have to become more dangerous to match. And therein lies the issue. Psychological horror is exactly that. Psychological. 
Once something attacks you, it stops being a mind game and becomes whack 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 stomp dead. The threat of violence is more important than the act itself. That's why there was such emphasis placed on hearing something approaching you long before you ever laid eyes on it. With a few exceptions, Silent Hill enemies never struck me as being particularly aggressive. They're more like an abusive spouse glaring at you, gaslighting you into wondering what you did wrong. They were scary because they were a combination of dangerous, revolting, and horny. Like a rattlesnake coiled up inside a used condom. You know instinctively to not go near it, and combating it should look like a nervous backpacker trying not to show his back to a cougar. And as far as improvements to the combat go, they really didn't change the combat that much. The new formula is just whack 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 dodge dodge whack whack stomp dead. They just added a boatload more enemies who are extremely aggressive. Puzzle design is another thing that was left on the altar of appealing to a broader audience. Most of the puzzles are related to your melee weapons. It's all pretty standard affair. The knife cuts through fleshy walls, the axe destroys boarded up doors, and so on. Though it does get a bit odd once they give you a crowbar to pry open locked doors. Not every locked door, mind you. Very specific ones. With the rest being immune to the force of torque. Continuing homecomings were living in the greatest hits of Silent Hill. Alex has to reach his arm into a dark hole to grab a teddy bear for his brother he saw earlier. The tension from these scenes in the past was not knowing whether something would grab your hand or not. But this time, the Silent Hill game comes with quick time events that kill you if you don't press X enough times. It is next to impossible to fill in nerve when you're directed to mash a button repeatedly to not die. <laughs> Turns out the nightmarish hospital was all a dream. Because of course it was. Because that's how Silent Hill 1, 3, and 4 started. Not every Silent Hill game has to begin with a nightmare sequence where the protagonist dies. Silent Hill 2 didn't start with 1, and I know how much you like that game. At least they got the original composer, Akira Yamaoka, to make the theme song, as opposed to Downpour signing Korn. But what I found missing are the industrial sounds of a combine harvester, rhythmically mating with the bottling plant, which I feel is so key to Silent Hill that its absence makes it no longer a Silent Hill game. Instead, they have someone blowing two notes on a trombone when enemies are around. Hometown? You could say that. Good luck, soldier. The truck driver who gives Alex a ride to Shepherd's Glen is none other than Travis Grady, protagonist of Silent Hill Origins, a prequel to the first game. And despite him encountering the messed up stuff that goes on in Silent Hill, he had no problems driving through the same area again and doesn't recognize the fog world they're currently in. Not that it matters because this is his only part in the game. This town's so quiet. It's changed. Hmm. Yes. Not for the better, I'm afraid. That's an understatement. A town has changed when the old plant shuts down and everyone loses their job. This town looks like a neighbor's Castlevania. I've encountered a lot of bad flashback transitions in video games in my life, but bringing one on by accidentally blinding yourself with an actual flashlight is making my top 10 list of moments when developers thought they were being clever. You just know they thought the juxtaposition of flashlight and flashback was brilliant. This house was big enough for Alex and Josh to have separate rooms instead of sharing a bunk bed. What's even stranger is that Alex looks to be in his mid-twenties and is still sharing a bunk with his much younger brother. I miss your brother, Alex. Look, I'll find him. Alex's mother talks about Josh as if he's still alive, which just so happens to be what Alex believes. Her being near catatonic fits the bill of making her unreliable, I suppose. But Alex runs into several people while searching for Josh who would certainly know that he's dead, and the way around that issue is they act like Alex is just confused without explaining their meaning. The difficulty of writing a character who doesn't recall his own past trauma is that to keep it hidden, you have to keep them away from people who know the truth. This was avoided in Silent Hill 2 by having all the characters James ran into be complete strangers who are going through their own delusions. This puzzle requires you to fill a gas can from a semi-truck's fuel tank to power the water pump in the basement. Except Alex didn't have a siphon hose, so how did he get the gas into the can? Alex had to drain the water from the basement just so he could reach down and unlock the door that locks from the bottom for some reason. Something he could have done even in the flooded basement. It's not like the water was hiding how the door locks from him. This is his family home. He had to know about it. The basement door is your only way into the backyard, which is your only way into the kitchen. I bet the home burglary rate is extremely low in Silent Hill if it takes this much effort to get from room to room in a single home. I'm looking for my brother. You seen him? No. I haven't, Alex. If the game wants to present everyone being clueless about Josh, then it needed to at some point explain that his death was never reported. Otherwise, it makes no sense to how small the town is. Jesus, what the hell is going on here? I don't know. But every day there are more flyers to put up. Every day more people disappear. NPC characters in Silent Hill are normally broken and unreliable people who act odd because they are experiencing an entirely different reality from the protagonist, which could go a long way toward explaining why Ellie is out here in the middle of the night 
placing missing persons flyers on a billboard in an empty town where there are no people left to read them. There's a wrecked police car, a dead monster, and a bloodstain not 10 feet from her location. But contrary to the previous games, she isn't experiencing a different reality. So all of the characters exist in the same monster-filled town that only Alex seems to notice at the moment. And he doesn't even bother to ask her about the monsters, which I'm pretty sure would override a human's ability to be concerned with anything else. I got this from Deputy Wheeler. You should take it. Wouldn't the police be trying to contact anyone outside the town for help if they have working radios? What I really need is some information. Have you seen my brother Joshua? You want to talk to the mayor. He knows everybody's business. Once again, a question that should see a confused response is brushed off with a non-answer. Someone asking to see their dead brother is going to raise eyebrows. You know where I can find him? Sure. Same place he is every day. Digging up people's graves. You know, there's something seriously wrong with that guy. And the mayor has just been allowed to do that? I feel like the devs abuse the nature of Silent Hill rather than use it effectively. Just because Silent Hill is a location where reality can be very dreamlike doesn't mean you can get lazy. For instance, since the plot has no idea where to go, Alex returns to the graveyard to look for the mayor, finds a wristwatch inside of a coffin, then he gets a migraine and passes out, and when he wakes up, he's in an entirely different location inside Silent Hill instead of Shepherd's Glen. <laughs> Josh! No, wait, stop. I can't possibly run after you. Pyramid Head serves as an excellent litmus test for future Silent Hill games. Does your game have Pyramid Head in it? If yes, then the follow-up question would be, is your game Silent Hill 2? And if the answer is no, then you can conclude the devs misunderstood everything about the series. Please help me! Josh! Don't let me fall! Oh, ah! Josh has solid intuition. He knew his brother could survive that unsurvivable fall with no damage, so didn't bother helping him. I'm looking for my brother Joshua, and I know he used to be friends with your son. Have you seen either of them? Joey? Uh, Joey doesn't want to play with you. Even Mayor Bartlett fails the test of answering a question like a human being by responding, Isn't your brother dead? What the hell is this? Belongs to your son, doesn't it? Where is he? You found that wristwatch in a family grave. What the hell do you think it means, Alex? I guess I can find some scant praise for the boss monster designs. Especially this one. The three of them you come across are inspired by the particular method the town leader used to sacrifice their child. Mayor Bartlett buried his son alive and a wristwatch was his totem. So the monster is summoned to kill Bartlett, smashes him into the ground, and has four meat sacks lining the area mimicking the face of a clock you have to go around smashing before you can kill it. Since Alex passed out to get to Silent Hill from Shepherd's Glen, he has to pass out again to get back, finding himself inside the sheriff's jail cell. I guess that's supposed to be a nod toward the opening of the first Silent Hill where Harry woke up in a diner with Sybil. Last thing I remember, I was in a greenhouse with Mayor Bartlett. <laughs> Sam Bartlett? That lunatic? Where is he? I got a couple of questions I'd like to ask him about what's been going on around here. I think those questions should have been asked a lot earlier. The town is deserted and falling apart, neither of which could have happened in a single night. He's dead. Dead? Shit! Man, you better start telling me what you're up to, Alex. I want to know right now. I don't know which is worse, Homecoming's horribly stereotyped black sheriff or Downpour's horribly stereotyped magical black mailman. It's weird that it happened twice though and only in western developed games. I'm just trying to find my brother, okay? I, I thought the mayor might know something. His son is missing too. A lot of people are missing! And yet another person fails the test. And this is the sheriff. He should definitely know Alex's brother has been dead for some time. There's even a photo of him and Alex's dad on a police boat together. So he knew the family well. It was some kind of creature. But worse than the others. It, it came to life out of the goddamn tree. That's what killed him. And that's the truth. I swear. So you've seen the creatures too? We should get moving. I'm not sure it's safe here anymore. This only proves that all the characters are sharing the same fog world together, which makes Ellie look like a massive idiot. Listen, I think I know someone that can help us out. The doctor is tied up in all the same shit as the mayor. Doc Fitch? Yeah, they all know a hell of a lot more than they're letting on. And I'm sick of being in the dark. They? Who are you talking about? No time for that now, Alex. Just trust me. We need to get to the doctor before something happens to him too. Sheriff Wheeler explains he just knows Doc Vic as part of what's going on. No time to explain means they ran out of room with a post-it note they wrote the plot on. Alex! Wheeler! Come in! I'm on my way to the sheriff's station! Something's after me! Ellie gave a radio to Alex earlier. Did Wheeler give her two radios for some reason? You have to escape the station on your own after a monster collapses the ceiling and separates you from Sheriff Wheeler. How he ever got you down here into a cell is a question I'd like answered, since the station is full of monsters and boarded up doors. 
These monster designs would be a lot more effective if they didn't introduce them in well-lit cutscenes. Hearing my radio crackle, followed by the sounds a new monster makes as it shovels toward me, before being illuminated by my flashlight is far more effective means of establishing a new mob. Come on, we need to find Dr. Fitch. We'll be safer underground. That has never once been true when anyone has uttered it. It took two people to lift that sewer grate, but Alex can close it with one hand. Your sister. I didn't know. She vanished when all of this started. Your mom told me things had changed. I guess I didn't realize. That's how you respond? A lady you met at the start of the game lost her other daughter recently, and simply said the town had changed without seeming at all stressed about losing a child. I have a suggestion for game designers. If you insist on placing sewer levels in your games, then you have to hire a sewer maintenance worker to explain what they're actually like, instead of imagining them as urban dungeons full of hand crane grates and avenues wide enough for two lanes of traffic. Ellie says this, but after a monster attack, the gate opens on its own, despite all of them being hand cranked. Also, there's a blood stain at the end of the tunnel that is presumably Ellie's, but isn't. She actually ran off, leaving you locked in the sewer with no way out, and didn't even bother to raise you on the radio. And the game never holds her to account for this. One had a lifting of sewer manhole covers again. It's amazing how you can use the sewer to travel to a different section of town when the town is cut off by large fault lines that run through the streets, where one normally finds sewer mains. What have you done? Stay away from me! No, wait, stop. I can't possibly chase after you. Just like last time, Alex finds an item belonging to the child of the town leader he's searching for and passes out after a migraine, awakening in Silent Hill again. Alex makes his way through the most terrible level in the series to find Doc Vic and give him his daughter's doll. Apparently Alex hasn't learned cause and effect, because the last time he did that with Mayor Bartlett and his son's wristwatch, it got the man killed by a monster that spawned from it. Same happens here. For whatever reason, once you kill the monster, a key to the town hall flies out of it. Then, since the interlude is over, the game sends Alex back to Shepherd's Glen where he can use the key. If we're going to spend so much time in Silent Hill anyways, why sit part of the game in a town that is just like Silent Hill but across the lake? In the secret basement of the town hall, Alex finds an ornate ceremonial dagger that is actually just a doorknob for a butcher room in his dad's basement. The game never explains why Alex's dad has a secret butcher room. He wasn't murdering people in there, so I guess he just liked to cut steak in private. This is a symbol of our family's past future. Can I wear it? Yes. Joshua, you are never to show anybody this ring. Not even Alex. How exactly is Alex having a flashback at the time his brother Josh was given the family ring when Alex wasn't present for it and didn't even know about this? Alex's father left a note that explains the order was kidnapping and brainwashing the people of Shepherd's Glen, explaining where all the people went. Except that it doesn't, because how can you kidnap an entire town full of people without anyone noticing? Why would no one leave town when it became apparent people were disappearing? It's around this point that I realize Homecoming is adapting the Silent Hill movie more than the games. The cult shows up and they are dressed like coal miners, which made some sense in the movie because Silent Hill was described as a coal mining town in West Virginia that suffered a coal seam fire. But this is not the case here. Silent Hill is still a small resort town like it's always been, so a bunch of coal mining cultists make zero sense. Your family home turns into a hell world version of itself, and I can honestly say this is the only part that ever felt like it belonged in something called Silent Hill. It's full of actual puzzles that have themes, and showcases Alex's mother's guilt and apathy, along with hinting at that Alex's military career isn't exactly real, and finally manages to feel oppressive instead of throwing a bunch of monsters at you. Elle, I thought you were- She's gone. Who? My mom. I can't find her anywhere. The entire town's gone. We last saw Ellie in the sewer, and it was strongly implied she was attacked and injured. Apparently, she just abandoned you to go look for her mom, and conveniently forgot that she had a radio she could use to tell you she was okay. I think I know where they are. I found this. I'm not sure what it all means, but we need to get to Silent Hill. This game does understand that Silent Hill is full of regular people who would find it odd that their town is suddenly full of people from the town across the lake. There's the real world, the fog world, and the hell world. I assume the kidnapped people end up in the real world, but none of this matters because the missing town people issue is never brought up again or resolved. What is with the boats being the only vehicle that can ever remain working in these games? I'm glad you're back. I feel safer with you here. I can only assume they added a soulless love interest to ensure no one suspected Alex of being a pedophile, since he spends the whole game obsessing over young children. I heard enough. When I decided to move east, I was looking at a job in Brahms, working with the police. At the time, they had this cop. I can't remember her name, but she'd gone to Silent Hill. Well, what happened to her? No one knows. The 
found a bike outside of town. This is the kind of small world storytelling a Resident Evil game would use, referring to previous characters and stories. It feels wildly out of place in Silent Hill where the only connection is the town itself. I guess there's some sort of irony here. There's supposed to be, but I haven't come across any. Does Ellie have Alex's jacket draped over his shoulders to keep warm, while Alex is still wearing his own jacket? Somehow, while their boat was moving, order members in rowboats snuck up on them and grab Ellie and Wheeler. Then Alex is knocked out by another boat nudging them and falls into the water. This should be a pretty important moment, considering how Alex's brother died falling off a boat into the same lake, but it's just a stupid way to transition and get rid of the other two characters for a while. If only Josh had been so lucky to wash up on the beach instead of drowning. Death gripped Ellie's locket tightly and never let go while you're out cold in the water, huh? Wheeler? Is that you? Talk quietly, Alex. Thank God you're okay. Listen, they've taken us to the prison. It's horrible. They took L and they're about to- Wheeler. The Order forgot to take Wheeler's radio from them after they captured him. The gate is electrified. Damn it. It looks like they're running power from across the street. Hold up. You mean to tell me Overlook Penitentiary has a security gate connected directly to the public sidewalk, and that gate is electrified? How many pedestrians have accidentally electrocuted themselves on this thing? In the power plant, you have to fight order members who are protecting it. It feels incredibly odd fighting humans in a Silent Hill game. Previously, the only times that happened were against Sybil after being possessed, and Eddie and Silent 2 who tried to kill you after snapping. Duking it out with a bunch of normal dudes feels more alien than fighting monsters. Your main enemies inside the prison are order members as well. If you're going to have Alex killing humans, then he needs to have a reaction to that. Defending yourself against monsters is one thing, but gunning down people elicits a different emotional response. I let Wheeler out of his cell, and while talking with Alex, he waves a revolver around that he didn't pick up, nor did Alex give him one, meaning he had that with him in the cell and never used it on the order members guarding him. Fuck. You cuff him. I'll read him his rights. Was that a one-liner in a Silent Hill game? That may be the most mood-killing line in the series since Heather said blondes have more fun at the end of Silent Hill 3, right after she killed a god and cried for her dead father. Hey, let me try to open that gate. Got it. Why would Wheeler know the passcode for gates in Overlook Penitentiary? He's a local sheriff from another town. For a building I shut off the power to, there sure are a lot of electrical puzzles. Went a little overboard on the symbolism, did we? The game gives you the option to mercy kill your mother, but doesn't exactly give you a reason to until you've made the decision. She's just hanging there on a cross. It's only once you choose not to shoot her that the machine starts and draws and quarters her. Thank God you're alive. I was about to go to Looney Tunes in this Roach Motel. Welcome back, annoying stereotype who doesn't fit the tone at all. But I'm afraid I got more bad news. I found this on one of those order soldiers I roughed up. L's name's on it. Then we gotta get out of here. But what does the list mean? I assume it was a list of people to grab from the town, and they've grabbed her already. Her name being on a list is pointless now. Oh, thank God. How did you find me? We don't have time to talk. I've got to get you out of here. Elle, where is she? Is she okay? I don't know. I'll find her though, I promise. Judge Holloway, Ellie's mom, was also being held in the prison in Alex Freezer. This ends up being a rather curious moment, because the next time we see her she's giving orders to the cult, and she seems surprised that the order has taken her daughter, which I would assume she knows about since she runs it. They turn on the gas! <laughs> Let me make sure I got this right. You thought they were going to turn on poison gas from a wall vagina? Wheeler is grabbed by a monster inside the walls and pulled inside, and Alex fails to rescue him. So you'd be safe to assume Wheeler is dead and the game just improved. But he survives this. Apparently the monster turned him over to the cult. This monster was summoned to kill Judge Holloway just like the previous two were sent to kill the other town leaders. I doubt it would turn over a hostage to the cult that it's currently punishing for a failure to complete the sacrifice ritual. I'm not exactly sure how grabbing the wrists of the tiny hands on its back kill it. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been four years since my last confession. What could you have done that was so terrible? I took my role as a father and I turned it into a daily chore. Fed him, clean him, put him to bed. I treated the dog with more respect. I get the symbolism of a confessional booth scene, but is there any reason for Alex to take this seriously? He's inside a church in a hell dimension. Why on earth would he step into a confessional booth and listen to someone on the other side confess their sins? And his father belongs to an evil cult that sacrifices their own children. I don't think he's Catholic. Elle? Ellie still has her radio as well. She just waited much longer before using it. Alex comes across his dad strung up in the church, and despite the experience he just had with his mother, he doesn't even try to cut him free, but stands there and interrogates him instead. I'm here to save Joshua. Joshua? You can't save him. That's an interesting way of saying, you can't save your brother. He's dead. What are you talking about? 
These are mine. I'm a soldier. Just like you wanted. Alex, you've been in the hospital. I know. I was wounded in battle. No. A mental hospital. Alex being a soldier is the reason that unlike previous leads in the series, he's proficient in combat. If he was never actually a soldier, then that explanation flies out the window. Death gripping necklaces despite your situation must run in the family. Pyramid Head fulfills his contract obligations and splits Alex's dad in two. If you thought you would get to fight him because he's in the game, think again. He dips out and Alex doesn't even try to stop him from killing his father. Alex dons and orders Miner suit to get past some steam pipes, then gets onto an elevator with the junkyard owner who's just there in Silent Hill's other world like it's no big thing. This game is destroying the mystery of Silent Hill and making it seem ordinary. I guess he just knew it was Alex in the suit. I'm not sure what the tell was because Alex just stood there and listened to him. Family is the most important thing, Alex. I would do anything to protect them. That's why I sacrificed my daughter. What? The Founders. They had good intentions. They left the Order to start a new life in Shepherd's Glen, where they feared the wrath of our God. So they made a pact to keep us safe. All that was required was a small sacrifice. Our children. Once every 50 years. Maybe they should have tried a new state and converting to Mormonism instead of moving within viewing distance of the damn place. It doesn't feel like they've started much of a new life if they're just a town over and still perform cult rituals. One of us failed. Like the strength to fulfill his duty. Your father. Where's Joshua? <laughs> Don't you see? Because of him, our sacrifices were in vain! Still refusing to answer that question even though this is the perfect time to respond that Josh is dead, and that's the reason all this is happening. Because Alex's father failed to sacrifice Alex after he lost his other son. The only hope was to revive the order which our founders abandoned. But you were kidnapped by them and held in the prison's gas chamber. Alex had to free you. None of this makes a lick of sense. By kidnapping? By murdering? Murdering? I've given them life. Just when exactly did the Order start sacrificing everyone left and right? They always tried to maintain a low profile on Silent Hill, selling drugs and secretly going about their business. Mass killings are a little outside their MO. Drilling a hole in Alex's leg should make walking very difficult for the remainder of the game. But it doesn't. It's also an incredibly inefficient way of killing someone. Just like in the hospital, Alex breaks free of leather restraints and kills Judge Holloway. She could have let out the trigger of the drill at any point while Alex was turning it toward her. That is the sound of a chainsaw, not a circular saw. The sound they make is completely different from one another. Alex, my mother. I'm sorry, Al. Oh, God, I can't believe this. Since Shepherd's Glen required four sacrifices every 50 years, how did the town leaders convince the next generation, their own children, to continue the practice? Ellie would have had to murder her own child one day and she was completely unaware of all this cult business and is aghast at it. This feels like something you would need to indoctrinate a child in from a young age. Not just drop that fact on them when they're adult that the town is cursed and an angry god will destroy it if you don't murder children. Sadly, Willer is alive, somehow ending up in the cult's lair when the last time we saw him he was pulled into a wall vagina by a monster. And the cult has stabbed him with multiple knives but failed to finish the job somehow. You had the comical choice of saving him or leaving him to die. But if this was supposed to be a big moral choice, it falls really goddamn flat. The only thing you get for letting him die is an extra med kit. It also makes no sense that Ellie somehow gets him out of here, since we don't even know the way out, and she couldn't carry a 200 pound man around anyways. According to the sacrifice ritual, one of the shepherd children had to be drowned to death, which is exactly what happened. Why did that not count? With all the buildup, you would expect Josh's death to have been something truly horrible to make Alex repress the memory of it and delude himself into thinking he had become a soldier while away. On the night of Josh's death, Alex woke him up in the middle of the night to take him out on the lake in a rowboat for reasons. The game never gets around to mentioning them, other than their dad told him not to go out on the lake. Then after showing Alex a family ring their father had strictly told him not to show to Alex, he tried to take it back and Josh fell, hit his head and drowned. I honestly think the devs got cold feet. 
and Alex was supposed to have murdered Josh out of envy over how their parents treated Josh as their favorite. All the signs were there. Their father had treated Alex coldly so as not to develop attachment to the son he planned to sacrifice. Regardless, his accidental drowning doesn't carry enough emotional weight to explain how thoroughly Alex repressed his memory of it. I told you death gripping the necklace runs in the family. After that realization, it's time to fight the final boss. A big pregnant spider lady. I have no idea what that's supposed to symbolize, other than to give Alex something to aggressively C-section. So his brother falls out and Alex has something to eulogize. I didn't go anywhere? No, Alex. And you won't be going anywhere until you can start to accept reality and responsibility. As tradition, there are multiple endings. But unlike in Silent Hill 2, where your ending is determined by subtle actions, like reading your wife's letter and looking at her photo often, your ending in Homecoming is determined only by what dialogue choices you made. I got the ending that suggests all this was just a hallucination in Alex's mind back in the hospital while they treat him with electroshock therapy, which I suppose is probably the most fitting ending for a game that ripped off Jacob's ladder. But for a Silent Hill ending, it's about as insulting as you get. Since Silent Hill is a very real supernatural place in the fiction, now I wait to get my hands on the Silent Hill 2 remake to see if they screwed that one up.